Do you remember François Magendy, the French scientist we mentioned in one of our first videos who was doing nutrition experiments with dogs at the beginning of the 19th century? He was the one who found out that if he fed dogs only with carbohydrates or only with lipids, they would all die within a month. Without proteins in our diet, life is not possible because proteins are our only source of nitrogen. But the richest protein sources also tend to be expensive, and so François Magendie was doing research to try to solve this problem, finding a cheap source of animal proteins that would be able to ensure good nutrition for the general population. And he thought he had found a wondrous solution, gelatin. Gelatin is an animal source of proteins, and it has a lot of them, 86 grams of proteins per 100 grams of dry gelatin. Gelatin is obtained from collagen, so if you take the bones and skins and other collagen-rich tissues of animals, cattle, poultry, fish, and boil them for a very long time, and then dry what you have extracted, you get a powder that has a very nice property. If you heat it, it forms a very nice, tasteless, reversible gel with water. Reversible means that if you heat it up, it becomes liquid. If you cool it down, it becomes solid. And you can do this over and over again. This has many applications in food industry. Gelatin is used for ready-to-eat foods, sauces, meat products, and then of course with some colors and flavors to make your jello desserts. But for François Magendie, gelatin was the solution to the hunger problem. It is a rich source of animal protein and it's very cheap. So he took another group of dogs, fed them gelatin, expecting that they would thrive, and instead to use his own words, they all died against every reasonable expectation. What was wrong? You will be able to answer this question at the end of this video. You already know that one amino acid cannot substitute for another in protein synthesis. The code for building proteins is written with great precision in our DNA. For each protein, it tells us exactly what is the sequence of amino acids that need to be put together. We cannot just take an amino acid and put it in place of another one. Remember what happened in sickle cell anemia? There was just one wrong amino acid in the whole sequence and that was enough to mess everything up. Luckily, however, of the 20 amino acids that we need to build all of our different proteins, 11 can be interconverted into one another via the transamination reaction. This means that if we need a specific amino acid to build a specific protein and we don't have it, in most cases we can take another amino acid and using stuff that's usually readily available around the cell, we can convert it to the amino acid that we need. However, we cannot do that with the remaining nine amino acids, which for this reason are called essential. Remember that in nutrition, the word essential refers to nutrients that we cannot build ourselves, and it has nothing to do with importance. All the 20 amino acids are vital and we need all of them to survive, but nine of them cannot be interconverted in our body or made starting from something else, and so they must come directly from food. And we need to get all of them, because if we miss even just one, then we will be in trouble when we need it to build a protein. To illustrate this concept, let's make a little example. Imagine the cell needs to build this imaginary simple protein, a tripeptide made of just three amino acids, glycine, aspartate, and lysine. And so what will happen is we will look for the instructions in the DNA, make our mRNA, give it to the ribosomes that will start reading it and say, okay, so to make this protein, we first need glycine. And imagine that this is the pool of amino acids that are available in that specific cell at that specific moment. We need glycine, here is lysine so we can take it, that's good, and on to the next one. Now we need aspartate, but oh oh, there is no aspartate available. However, as it turns out, aspartate is one of the non-essential amino acids, and it can be made from glutamate. So what we can do is we can take glutamate, make a transamination to aspartate, and now we're good to go. We can take aspartate, bring it next to glycine, make a covalent bond, our peptide bond, and on to the next one. Now we need lysine. And again, we are out of luck. There's no lysine available. But now we are in trouble. 
because lysine is one of the nine essential amino acids. So there is no way we can make lysine starting from what we have. It doesn't matter, we can have thousands of other amino acids. If we don't have lysine, we will be stuck and we will not be able to make the protein we need because lysine is essential, we don't have it, it doesn't matter how much protein we have unless we have that amino acid, we are stuck. We cannot go on with our protein synthesis, which of course is not good. This leads us to the so-called all or none principle. Think of the craftsmen you need to build a new house. You need the carpenter, the bricklayer, the plumber, the electrician, the engineer, and the architect. Now, if everybody shows up but the bricklayer, it doesn't matter that everybody else is present. You still cannot build your house because without walls, you have no use for water pipes and electric cables. In other words, either all of them are present or none can be used. And so because the bricklayer didn't show up, you'll have to send everybody else home and you won't have built your new house. The all or none principle applies to essential amino acids as well. Depletion of just one essential amino acid prevents protein synthesis. We do not have lysine, there is no way we can make our protein using something else. Just like we cannot ask the plumber to put up the walls. We needed the brick layer for that. And so either all essential amino acids are available or none can be used. It doesn't matter that we have a lot of the other ones, we need that one. Even if we have seven plumbers available, we still cannot build our walls. And then on top of that, the remaining amino acids cannot even be stored for later use because our body doesn't really have a system to store proteins or amino acids for more than a few hours. So we cannot even say, okay, we don't have lysine now, so we can just save these other amino acids for later, and then once we have lysine, we can bring them back and complete our protein. It doesn't happen. We cannot store them, so if we have no use for them at that specific moment, we will have to throw them away, or use them for something else, but certainly not for protein synthesis, which is the most important use we have for amino acids. And so the quality of a protein source depends on its essential amino acid content. As we will see later when we discuss protein requirements, we have a requirement for protein quantity, which is how many grams of total protein we need. But we also have a requirement for protein quality, meaning we want to make sure that we have all the nine essential amino acids, because if we don't have all of them, then we can have all the protein we want. It's protein we won't be able to use for protein synthesis. This also explains the disappointing results of François Magendi and his dog's fat collagen. Gelatin is a very rich source of protein quantitatively, but the quality of its protein is very, very low, because it lacks not one, but four essential amino acids, tryptophan, isoleucine, threonine, and methionine. So it doesn't matter that you get a lot of proteins from gelatin, it's protein that you cannot use unless you get those four lacking essential amino acids from somewhere else. The set end of Magendi's dogs is a good reminder that protein quality is as important as protein quantity. There are also a couple amino acids, cysteine and tyrosine, that are referred to as conditionally essential amino acids. These amino acids are not strictly essential because we can build them ourselves, but we can only build them starting from essential amino acids. Tyrosine can only be made from phenylalanine, which is essential. If we lack phenylalanine, we will lack tyrosine as well, unless we get it as such from food. In other words, tyrosine would then become essential. The same happens with cysteine, that can only be made from methionine. Phenylketonuria is a condition resulting from a genetic defect that exemplifies how conditionally essential amino acids may become very important. These individuals lack the enzyme to make the conversion from phenylalanine to tyrosine, and this has two immediate consequences. The first, of course, is that tyrosine becomes essential because it cannot be made from anything else. And tyrosine is very important not only for protein synthesis, but also because it's the precursor of key hormones and neurotransmitters such as dopamine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline. The other consequence is that the dietary intake of phenylalanine must be strictly controlled. 
Indeed, conversion to tyrosine is the only pathway we have to metabolize phenylalanine if we have it in excess. If this is blocked, any extra phenylalanine cannot be cleared out and phenylalanine starts building up, resulting in serious neurological damage because phenylalanine is neurotoxic. Which is the reason why, if you remember when we discussed the alternative sweeteners, whenever a food contains aspartame, it has to carry a warning on its label that it is a source of phenylalanine. Luckily, all newborns are screened for PKU so that their diet can be strictly controlled. 